we have, as we had last year, a panel of women from uh, uh, different, what should I say, denominations of Judaism, uh, Orthodox, Conservative, Masorti, and Reform. And um, because today's subject was to be, among others, the other, how we relate to the other in Judaism, uh, how we do, how we should, uh, perhaps would be um, more appropriate for, the, for today's topic, I hope, I don't know. Um, we have a lot of others in our community today, not only the obvious one, men, women, uh, adults, children, but uh, with the ingathering of the exiles and with the arrival of asylum seekers, uh, and foreign workers, to say nothing of the local non-Jewish Palestinian Arab uh, population, I think we have a lot of cheshbon nefesh to do uh, regarding how we relate to the other. Um, I just want to mention one case because I'm very troubled by it. Uh, there's recently been, I'm sure you've, you're all familiar with it, I'm sure, the, ca the case of the seven-year-old girl who claims to have been raped by an Arab worker. The assumption in the news coverage was immediately, yeah, it's, he's guilty. The assumption in the, what I heard in sort of people talking, ah, you know, of course, the Arab. And it reminded me, now it turns out that she wasn't raped at all, right? Yeah. Today's papers say that medical examination at her health service revealed that she was not raped, right? And it makes me think of the blood libels against Jews, right? in the times when Jews were the other, the outsider, the one who was always suspected when there was some attack on a Christian, particularly a Christian child. And the myth that on Seder night, Jews killed Christian children to drink their blood at the Seder. Right? And I remember my grandmother telling us about, at the Seder, telling us about the days in Galicia where she was born, and my mother, my parents were born, that uh, Jews left their doors open on Seder night in order to be able to prove that there was no reason to suspect them. Right? So, we have a lot of, as I say, reflection to do about how we relate to the various others in our lives. And I'm looking forward to hearing three different versions, uh, accounts of how each uh, particular uh, denomination in Judaism relates to various others. So over to you, Diana. Okay, Diana. We're not really going to talk uh, as representatives of each denomination, each one of us in a s somewhere on the spectrum of, of the movement that she belongs to, and each one of us picked a different other to talk about. So, Harabah uh, uh, Mira Chovav is a rabbi of a reform congregation in Balsheva, and, uh, uh, and uh, a rabbi, uh, Jenny, Rabbanit Jerry Rosenfeld is, uh, works with uh, Rab Shlomo Riskin in Efrat. And uh, most of you know me, I'm Diana Vil, I teach here at the Schechter uh, Rabbinical School. And so each one of us will take a different subject. We decided that each one of us will talk about 15 minutes. And uh, if you have questions, write them down. And at the end, we'll leave enough time for a question and answer period. Okay. So. Uh, Okay. Um, so the other, everyone picked, ev the three of us picked different others to speak about. Um, the other that I want to talk about in the community today is 
people who don't fit into the traditional family structure, okay? Um, it includes singles, uh, people who either marry later or marry not at all, um, people in the LGBTQ community, um, those who were married and got divorced um, or widowed, and single parent families of various, um, arranged in various different ways. Okay, so what I, I wanna talk about are two different realms um, that I think challenge or, or challenge the community in terms of accepting and in being fully inclusive of people in these different types of family structures. Um, and I think that there's really two realms that I wanna split in terms of where the challenge is. One realm is the community and what model does the community set up of the normative family, and how does the community deal with people who don't fit into that clear box? And the second realm that I want to speak about is the side of halakha, of Jewish law, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll go through as many of these communi uh, communities as, as we have time for, um, but discussing kind of what are the halachic challenges that are embedded in, in these um, types of existence, and, um, and then just discussing those two different types of challenges um, from the perspective of the Orthodox community um, that, I, that I'm part of. Um, so the first, the first group that I wanna talk about is singles. Um, it's, it's a group, the unmarried individuals. Um, it, the question is one that really is very close to my heart, and um, I actually wrote my doctorate many years ago um, in New York um, on the topic of trying to carve out a, okay. It, for me, it's, it's, it's over a decade, okay? That's a long time, okay. All right, okay. A few years ago, um, make me feel better that I haven't yet turned it into a book. Um, on, on, on the topic of, of singles and sexuality and struggle and trying to carve out a sexual ethic that could speak to, um, the singles halachically observant community. Um, I think that the challenge there, I'll, I'll start on the communal level. On the communal level, there's the fact that synagogues and communities have traditionally, and I, I think it's, it's, not, it's no accident, but have traditionally been built around families. Um, and suddenly when you have people who don't fit into that family model, either there's an assumption or a reality um, that they're more transient, that they're gonna pass through the community, but that they're more, that they're more portable, right? They'll get a job somewhere and then they'll, they'll leave the community. So kind of like, well, why should we invest in you? Why should we invite you, you know, to the Shabbat meals and get really connected to you? And then you'll you know, go, go somewhere else after a couple of years. Um, but I think that on a deeper level, there's a feeling of, you know, the shul, the synagogue structure being one that's structured around, obviously, the, the, main, the main davening, the tefillah. But then there are also all of these the other pockets and, and the youth movement, the youth, um, um, whatever it's called, you know, davening for the kids or programming for the, for the children is also a big part of it, which is something that kind of fits into the family structure. And a lot of times, um, people who are unmarried and in their later 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and, and beyond can feel like they don't necessarily have a place in that, and like they don't necessarily have a place in terms of becoming part of the community and, and being invited, because sometimes people will kind of overlook them, okay? In other words, a, a, a single individual can come to the synagogue and be, be davening there for weeks at a time, and, and no one, might approach them the same way as if a family came in with, with a number of little children, they would, they would get approached probably on their, first, um, on their first Shabbat. And that's something I think that creates, obviously among singles, a feeling of, of alienation um, that doesn't need to be so, the case, okay? In other words, there's no, there's no halachic reason, and we'll get to the, the side of halacha in a second, but there's no halachic reason why singles shouldn't be accepted welcomed into the community, invited for Shabbat meals, the same way that a family would be. Um, and so there I think, and the truth is for many of these categories, I think the problems, um, I think the communal problems are of a different nature than the halachic problems. I think the communal problems are arise from stereotypes, discomforts, whatever it is amongst the people, but that ultimately don't have 
um, a root in, in Judaism. In other words, it's certainly not a Jewish approach, certainly not an Orthodox approach to say that just because someone is single, we're not going to embrace them into the community the way we would embrace anyone else. Um, I think that where the challenge for singles comes in um, is a lot more in the halachic realm. Okay, um, Jewish law, and again, I'm speaking from the Orthodox perspective, and it would be interesting if we were all speaking about the, um, the same topic, or perhaps during the question and answer period, there'll be a chance to see, well, what, what would the conservative uh, approach be to this? What would the reform approach be to this? But I'm giving the, the Orthodox perspective, um, according to halacha, um, a person can't um, have a sexual relationship, a physical relationship outside of marriage. And I think that this is something that in the modern world where we have a sense of sexuality as part of who we are and not just kind of something that can be put aside or left to some um, indefinite period of time, it cr definitely creates a conflict between those who are committed to halakha and committed to halakha from, from, from the time they were born and then suddenly find themselves in circumstances which they didn't necessarily expect to find themselves in. And suddenly, they're 30, 35, they're not married, and halakha demands of them the same type of, you know, abstaining from physical contact that it demands of a teenager, okay? And, there, and then there's, there's a, a real feeling of, um, I think, of a disconnect between the expectations and the demands of halakha and reality and humanity. And that's something that I think that for the, the, the person who's unmarried within themselves and committed to orthodoxy, a real deep religious conflict can result. Um, and there are various different ways that people deal with that conflict. One way that I'll, that I'll throw out there because it's real is simply by saying, forget about it. If, if halakha can't speak to me in this realm and, and doesn't understand what I'm going through, then then why should I bother davening? Why should I bother keeping kosher? I'm, I'm out. Okay, that's, that's, it's one approach. It's an approach that I feel like is, um, um, is very sad. Um, but that's, that's one approach. And then there are others, and this is the, the approach that I've, that I've tried to take, is really to find some sort of reconciliation of what does halakha have to say to a person who's in a situation that seems to be untenable, or there seems to be no good solution. Um, and I think there, if we go back, and again, say, trying to touch on this very briefly so that we'll get to talk about some of the other, um, some of the other others that I mentioned, um, I think that if we go back to the concept of sin and repentance, okay, which are very traditional concepts, but concepts that I think in today's world have less of a, less of a space than they did in the past, um, and I'm specifically drawing on the Torah of Reb Tzadok HaKohen Milublin, a 19th century Polish Hasidic um, Rebbe, um, who put a lot of these ideas in, in his Sefer Tzidkat HaTzadik, um, which I highly recommend. Reb Tzadok writes about the necessity of religious struggle and failing as building a person's religious identity. Okay, and he, he quotes various sources, he rereads, he reads against the grain various traditional sources um, to, to come up with the idea that it's only through stumbling and failing in a particular realm that you can truly understand what God wanted of you in the first place. Um, and it's, I think, a radical interpretation because most of us grow up, I, know, I, I grew up with a, with a sense that, you know, there's, there's tshuva, there's repentance, but it's better if you do everything right the first time, right? There wasn't really an ideology of you need to struggle and fail in order to grow. That's not something that, that, that I at least got in my, in my Jewish education. And it's, it's a switch that Reb Tzadok makes and he turns the sin basically into an opportunity, um, and he, he writes even further than that, that if a person is struggling in a certain realm, if a person is sinning in a certain realm, they need to see that as God's particular message to them of where they need to fix something in their life right now. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically an invitation, an impetus to, to, to move forward in, in one's religious struggle and quest. So 
I think that the ideas of Reb Tzadok are ones that can be very relevant to people um, in, the, in the unmarried um, Orthodox community. I also think that something that's critical is to bring out a sexual ethic, which is something that exists within Jewish sources. There are many Talmudic stories um, that can be put together into a sexual ethic, even what, what I call an ethic of transgression, which basically has the ability to speak to people even when they're not observing the halakha. I think that it's something that the, that the Orthodox community needs to speak more about in, a, in an open way, basically to educate on the one hand, this is what the halakha says, and the halakha does um, proscribe physical contact um, outside of marriage, um, but at the same time, there's an awareness, and throughout the generations, there have always been people who haven't lived up to that standard. And if you're not living up to that standard, don't leave your Judaism at the door and, and just throw it all away, but say, no, I'm going to at least take a Jewish sexual ethic with me into this realm um, so that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disconnecting myself from, from my religion, which has been such a fundamental part of my life. Okay, so that's... Um, that's in terms of, of, of singles. And basically there, I think that the halachic challenges are great. And I think that the personal struggles that each individual goes through are, are serious. At the same time, I think that the communal issue is it's chaval, that the communal issue becomes such an issue because I think that that's not really where the struggle is or where the struggle should be. Um, and it, it might sound simple to say, but like the community just should be more welcoming. There's no reason for it for it not to be. Um, what? Um, okay. And and I and and I have to say, from from the limited amount that I've traveled around the world, there are definitely communities that do better at this, and communities that uh, that have that have more that have more to grow. Um, Okay, so the, 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 next, um, the next realm that I want to talk about are those who are divorced. Um, it's, it's interesting, and there might be some sitting in the room kind of questioning why I'm putting this into the category of an other. Um, one, of the, one of the striking things about divorce, um, I think that it definitely does something on the communal level in terms of splitting people in the community, having a feeling that you know, once this, you know, this couple used to sit at our Shabbos table as a couple, and now that they're no longer a couple, there's like this, this somehow this need to take sides. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that's something that's the first thing that's difficult for the, for the divorcing couple, the feeling that, yes, everyone has taken their side and looking at the people in the community and even in the leadership of the community and feeling like, a, a shifting of, 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 who, of who they can trust. Um, I also think that in terms of the Jewish communal um, structure, there's a challenge, which a lot of times is found today in, um, in joint custody agreements, where a, a person who's divorced might, on the Leil HaSeder, have their 10 children with them and a huge bustling house, and then, and then the, it makes the rituals more meaningful, and then they're going to shul, and then the last day of Pesach, you know, the spouse has the kid, and suddenly they're totally alone. And, and, and that aloneness, when one is used to having the, the family structure, can also raise questions in terms of one's observance. Well, suddenly they're alone the entire day, and, and, and no one's inviting them, and no one's looking out for them. So, so maybe they'll turn on their phone, or why should they go to shul? And, and, it's, and it creates this, this certain split and certain challenges um, that are sort of communal challenges, but then they become religious challenges as well. Um, and I think that there's also this, this feeling of being always a bit on the outside of the community. Um, I have to say, just because it's fresh in my mind, I just came here straight from my son's um, end of year gan party in the Sibat Siyum, which are happening every day now. And um, and there was a divorced couple in the in, in the gan. And, and first I saw one of the parents was there and I thought, okay, that's interesting that they split it and, and that's nice. So there's one parent there. And then the second parent walked in and it was suddenly like you saw, or one who was looking saw, suddenly like the kid who had been sitting on the on one parent's lap, then then jumps to the other lap, and you see this. It's it's 
I think I think that it's 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 a difficult dynamic having nothing to do with Judaism and nothing to do with halacha. Okay, but the Jewish structure and the communal, the heavily communal structure adds another layer of challenges, okay? Again, even for the parent to go and be invited to a Shabbat meal and bring all of their kids with them to a family that also has kids and then, and then fit in very well versus the next Shabbat to go totally alone can raise, can raise questions and, and discomforts for that person of like, well, here I am alone, but I'm not really alone. Know that I do have this this family. It's I, I think that it's very complicated to navigate it communally, and then I think the communal questions have also repercussions in terms of halachic questions, and then halachic considerations that people can can make. Um, do I have time to talk about the LGBT? I, I didn't I didn't look at the clock. So tell me, two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. So um, in in two minutes. Um, I'll, what, what I'll say um, about the LGBTQ community is, is as follows. Halachically, and certainly within the orthodox interpretation of halacha, um, there, there are very big questions. Um, I think that those questions can have specific answers, okay? I don't think that there's, I don't think that there's necessarily a full, perfect solution. I think that the solution is also, um, at the end of the day, built on the Torah of Reb Tzadok, who talks about struggle and failing, and sometimes a struggle is something that can accompany a person for a specific period of life, and sometimes a struggle is something that's embedded in the person's entire life um, and, and can define their religious identity. Um, but here, too, I think that the communal level is very different, okay? And 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 some of what happens in the community is all is 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 a shame because no one is asking any of the members of the community, um, any of the married members of the community, certainly whether whether they're observing properly the laws of Tara Tabishbacha, whether the wife is is immersing in the in the mikveh every month, whether they're keeping all of the separations that they should be keeping when she's when she's not before she's gone to the mikvah are their beds separated are they not touching each other at all no one no one's asking any questions and there we are talking about biblical prohibitions that can be violated in private and and no one knows um, and it's possible to have a um, a gay couple who makes decisions that are in their private life to make sure that they're not violating a biblical prohibition and they decide in their um, in their relationships only to violate a rabbinic prohibition. But people see two men standing together holding hands in front of the shul and suddenly it's like, it's, it's, it's not about the halacha, okay? It's not about Jewish law um, as much as it's about certain communal stereotypes and what, what a community wants to create. And, and here too, and I'll, I'll end on, just on, on this note, it, I would say that the community needs to be welcoming. The community should be welcoming, and the community doesn't have to be scared about being welcoming. And sometimes I think um, what drives alienating certain people as the other is, is a fear. And, and, and I've heard people express that fear explicitly. But if we're welcoming towards, towards singles, then people will think it's okay not to get married. And if we're welcoming towards gay, then gays, then people will think that that's like an acceptable life's choice. And I want to say to the community, no. No one will get confused. I think that, that living life either by oneself or as part, as, as part of the, um, the LGBTQ community is so difficult in so many different ways that having someone smile at you in shul and invite you to a Shabbat meal is not going to make this like a mass popular um, choice that people are running for. So I'll end with that, with the blessing that our communities be more accepting. Thank you very much, Rabbani Jenny. And uh, Mira, your turn. <laughs> Shalom, Tzoraim, Tovim. Thank you so much, Rabbanita Rosenfeld, uh, Professor Shalvi, uh, Arba Vila. Um, it just, I, 
I was marching yesterday at the uh, Pride Parade in Be'er Sheva. That's, for whoever does not believe in miracles, that's a miracle. It's only the third year that it's, go that it's happening in Be'er Sheva. And the first year, we, um, I, was, I was not there. I was in my previous congregation at, at the time. But um, they had to, it was not allowed to do it on the main street because chas v'chalila, God forbid someone may, uh, it, it might look like an encouragement of that uh, <laughs> lifestyle. And for, it's the second year that it's, it's all over Be'er Sheva. And uh, I don't know, I did not count the people, but it seemed like there are more people this year than in the previous year. And we were very proud to be there as part of the Be'er Sheva Reform Congregation, Ramot Shalom, to, to be marching there uh, with the LGBT flag um, and the Magen David on it and Ve'avta Le'Reacha Kamocha on our banners. And I'm, I'm very happy that we, we, could, do, uh, we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And some things are easier for Reform Jews. <laughs> At least some things are, okay? Uh, and just relating to, to the previous session, Professor Shadwin and myself sat in Shula Ledersman uh, session before, and uh, the, uh, what was under discussion was Miriam's um, uh, character. Uh, the, the, the black woman that Moses uh, presumably took to be, uh, to be his wife, and that directs me to, uh, to what I wanted to talk about, which is uh, mainly about uh, the large community of Ethio Ethiopian uh, uh, Israelis from Ethiopian origin in, uh, in the state of Israel. Um, 150,000 people from Ethiopian origin in Israel uh, today. Uh, it's a very large community, very large community. Um, not, everybody, not everybody ever gets to see any Ethiopian Jews around them, just depends on where you live. And I was very lucky to, uh, to be leading the, um, uh, the Reform Congregation in Gadera for seven or eight years and to, to, be, to get in touch with a wonderful group of people there uh, called Garin Gadera. You might be familiar with the name Yuvi Chuma, who is one of the outstanding leaders of, uh, of, the, um, of, the, of Israeli uh, society in general. I, I, I don't think I, I should say a leader of Ethiopian Jews? No, she's, a, she's a, a, an Israeli leader, outstanding leader, and to, to learn a little bit about, about this community. And uh, I see it as part of my shlichut, as part of my mission as a rabbi, to, um, to bring that wonderful culture, that rich culture, uh, to, the, um, um, to the front, front line of, uh, of, Israeli, uh, of Israeli culture, of Israeli awareness. Um, as leaders, as rabbis, we often struggle with the question where, what should we choose? You know, should we go for the bigger picture or for the, for the local things? Uh, and in the reform movement in Israel, we are blessed to have a variety of outstanding leaders dealing with the bigger picture, with legislation, with um, uh, the Supreme Court, with members of Knesset, um, with uh, organizing huge demonstrations. Uh, it's wonderful to have them. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those people who, who, who is capable of doing this. However, I do believe that it is possible to have incredible... Um, influence. <laughs> okay. To have real impact, real influence even when acting locally. The, you know the environmental uh, slogan is uh, think globally and act locally. I'm not sure that I always think globally, but I do try to act locally. And yes, perot, we can see the fruit. We, we can actually see change um, in, in, various, um, uh, in, in various ways. So 4,000 people, 4,000 people, that's an incredible number. 4,000 people, Ethiopian Jews, lost their lives while practically walking the way from Ethiopia through the deserts of Sudan to the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, which they've always dreamed about. 4,000 people, it's, it's, an, it's beyond imagination. The numbers are beyond imagination. With, a, with the size of the community, that indicates that there's no family in Israel with people from uh, Ethiopia in it that did not lose someone, whether someone close or someone more, um, 
more remote or just an acquaintance. And um, I, until like 10 years ago or so, I, I had some vague idea that this was going on, but I've never heard any of the stories. I've never heard any of the stories. And uh, just like I mentioned before, as the rabbi in, in Gedera, I, I was privileged to, to be able to, to hear some of the stories. For the first time, I also heard the witnesses giving their testimonies for the first time, actually speaking about their experiences as survivors from that awful, from that horrendous uh, adventure, okay, journey. Um, and I was so ashamed of myself for not knowing about this anything beforehand. How could that be? I'm so much involved in the Jewish world. I'm so, I, I, I come from a, like a, I, I don't think there's any more Zionist family from the, Zion, from the family I grew up in, right? I care about the Jews. How come did I, how did it, this happen that I've never heard about this anything before? Okay. So what do we do? What do, we, what do we do about this? And um, I, I also want to mention that there are like two, um, two strata of trauma in that, in that respect. And uh, this is something that people who have gone through terrible things in their lives um, experience, no matter whether it's, it's this kind of struggle, this, this kind of adventure, or other kinds of, um, uh, of things that people have been through. One of them is actually being witnesses, being there, losing people, uh, seeing terrible things around you. The other, the, the, the next, the next strata is silence. Not having anybody um, appreciate what you've been through. Oh, we saved you from the desert. No, you, no, we didn't. No, we didn't. We brought you from terrible places to the wonderful state of Israel. <laughs> Lo mamash. Lo mamash. Okay. Um, and, uh, and the word, I, I think the, and some, some of the challenges th that these people go through are exactly the same, the same challenges that immigrants go, go through everywhere. Okay. I'm a first generation Israeli. Uh, both my parents, the Chonam Livracha, were Holocaust survivors. Uh, so I, my Hebrew was better than my parents. That's the same for Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian kids growing in Israel, growing up in Israel right now. Uh, I, I knew my way about better than my, my parents, who were sort of lost. I think my father started eating hummus after 50 years in Israel. He, he, he couldn't try that before. Okay? It, took, it was a long process, right? But nobody has ever um, questioned, um, uh, nobody has ever thought anything bad about our culture. They came from Western culture to Western culture. Their, um, their culture was very highly respected in Israel, too. Uh, their education was very highly respected in Israel, too. And um, nobody ever questioned my intellectual capacities. Ah, but nobody has ever told me, don't bother to study physics or math. That's not for you. You should keep with the simple things because, you know, you should know your place in society. Nobody has ever addressed me in that manner, which Ethiopian kids growing in Israel go through all the time, all the time. Do you know what's the best way to, uh, to raise the... Um, um, uh, um, Standard? Standard level. No. <laughs> 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 Standard. Achuzat zakaut lebagrut. Okay? How, how, do we, how do we raise the numbers? How do we get better statistics for, for our school, for the Bagrut, for the final exams? You just kick out the Ethiopian kids and then the numbers go up. That's very easy to do. That's very easy to do. Hmm? Oh, it is. Of course it is. Okay, um, so what do we do? First of all, um, comes one additional. Oh, that means one. Okay. <laughs> what do we do? First of all, listen to the stories. Make sure that each and every one of us 
knows the story of these people, not just about the, uh, the, um, uh, the journey, not, not just about the journey, but about whatever led to that journey, about their Zionism, about their yearning for to see Jerusalem. Jer they actually imagined Yerushalayim Shazahav, Jerusalem of gold. This is what they had in mind. We have so many Ethiopian women whose name is Yerushalayim, Yerusalem. Okay? Just to, to, to know a little bit about, about the culture. Um, there's an, um, an official commemoration day in, in honor of, of uh, Ethio the, uh, those uh, Ethiopian Jews who perished on their way. Okay? Um, the date is Yom Yerushalayim, Kafchet Be'yar. Okay? By the way, this is a wonderful opportunity for us as liberal Jews to celebrate our, re uh, our renewed connection with Jerusalem without being part of those celebrating Yom Yerushalayim in ways that we don't want to relate to. I don't want to, to walk through uh, the streets of the Muslim quarter in, in, um, in the old city and um, intimidating the, uh, the, Muslim, uh, uh, the, the Muslim people there, right? That's not my, my way of celebrating my connection to Jerusalem. Okay? So, um, we're, uh, I'm very proud that after, for a few years, we've been the only community in the reform, uh, in the reform uh, movement in Israel to have those special evenings uh, you know Zikaron Basalon, right? So it's Zikaron Ethiopi Basalon. We were the first one to have it in uh, uh, in Gadera. I see Ilana, you, you, you've been to one of these um, uh, to uh, one of these gatherings, and uh, this year, as a, the rabbi in, in uh, Be'er Sheva, we managed to have them uh, in in Be'er Sheva too. But it, we're, we were no longer the only ones. It, it was like I think like ten or or twelve communities all around the country, and I very much hope that this tradition spreads around, not just in, in, uh, in reform congregation, not, not just in Israel, but all over. And when I visit sister congregations in the United States and in Canada, I tell the story, and most of the people attending have never heard that story before, and that's so important. That's one part. The other thing is that we can learn about Ethiopian culture. Okay? Um, there's a special, there's the special um, uh, holiday, uh, the special Jewish Ethiopian holiday of the Sigd. It, it, occur, uh, uh, it is celebrated seven weeks after Yom Kippur. It's just like another kind of Sfirat Omer, se counting seven, uh, seven weeks. So I'm not an Ethiopian Jew. I do not participate in the, in the uh, traditional Ethiopian um, services which are, uh, are held all over. The main one is in Ormona Natsiv, just um, uh, overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. Um, this is not part of my tradition. However, I can use that spe special day, the Sigd, uh, to, to teach about Jewish Ethiopian tradition, to teach about the yearning for the land of Israel, to teach about the special foods, to, to listen and to learn the music. Uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, learn, uh, to learn something about the special art, okay? and to learn uh, all kinds of interesting things that each and every one of us can benefit from by just, uh, be, uh, just being exposed to that kind of culture. Okay? Uh, two years ago, or perhaps three years ago, I'm not sure. Mr. Um, uh, the SIGD is usually somewhere in November. Okay? Uh, that these are the day when there is a huge uh, use enrollment into into the IDF. One of those main days, uh, two or three years ago, was on the day of the Sigd. Okay, just imagine what does it mean for uh, an Israeli, uh, 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 an Israeli from a, an Ethiopian origin, that the army tells her, him or her, "You should come now, and we don't care about your culture. We just don't care." That's the day when you have to enlist. To, uh, what does it, where does it put that person relating to, to the state of Israel, relating to their own culture? So the changes are, are truly gradual. This is not, this doesn't just happen. But I, I think that kids who grow up in those communities, uh, they, they're not from um, Ethiopian origin, but they learn about this tradition and they know something about it when they, Sometime in the future, they become, I don't know, the chief of staff or whatever. They will not have 
that sixth day as a day of enlistment for um, um, uh, for, for for soldiers in, in general, not just for those from an Ethiopian background. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. Um, I cannot change the uh, um, the policy of the chief rabbinate who doubts the Judaism of those uh, of, of those Jews. I there I there's so many things that we cannot change, but there are also so many other things that we can change and we can affect. And I feel that it's not just our uh, duty to do it; it's our Jewish duty to to do the best we can. In that um, um, in, in that way. So, okay, I chose to talk about the attitudes towards other religions, especially monotheistic religions. Uh, much of the things that have been said now resonate with my experience with this issue. Uh, when Alice started talking about the. A Palestinian who was uh, falsely accused, and uh, when uh, Mira, Mira spoke about the uh, um, against uh, how people relate to people from, you know, blacks, that they very often say that's the reason that they relate to them like that because of their color of their skins. Um, I thought we should go back, like, to the very beginning in the Bible when we are told that we are. Uh, chosen people, and I think a lot of it comes from there, from the way people understand what it means that we are a chosen people. Uh, people take it very often to mean that it's uh, something, it's superiority, it means that we are better, it means that uh, our religion is not only our true religion, but it's the true religion and everything else is not uh, uh, valid. Um, it's true that uh, there are a lot of uh, limitations in our relations to uh, people from other religions in the early sources, especially in the Talmud, where the other religions were idolatrous religions and where the, the Jewish law um, is wary of people mixing with all of these other people and end up being idolatrous and end up uh, doing intermarriage and, and going in, in the wrong directions. Uh, but it is uh, very clear from the development of Jewish law uh, that uh, we have to look at a different uh, reality. Um, when uh, the, the Mishnah already speaks about how every person uh, that, that one kills is like a whole world because the whole world came from Adam. In the same way, every single person is made in the image of God and is going and is and we should respect them for being a person, uh, notwithstanding whether they're Jewish or not Jewish. Uh, the very important thing is also to take into account how that when we're talking today about people of other religions, we are not talking about uh, Roman idolatry. We're talking mostly in the Western world about Christians and in our area a lot about Muslims, and these are completely different religions. It's very interesting that Maimonides, when he writes about the Christians and the Jew and the and the Muslims, Muslims, in a section that was actually censored in his Mishneh Torah, he talks about how both Jesus and Muhammad advanced uh, the, the humanity in the right direction, and they advanced the, in the direction of uh, messianic times when things will be better because uh, they took the moral principles that are in our Bible and they uh, disseminated them among all the peoples of the world. Um, I, th I think that in Israel this gets, uh, uh, especially when it comes to Muslims, it's not only a question of religion, it's also a question of uh, most Arabs are Muslim, and so we are terribly prejudiced against this, and uh, that's why people can say automatically if he was an Arab or a Muslim, he certainly was a terrorist, and all the only thing they want is to kill Jews. Uh, I had the privilege of working for a few years with a group of uh, Muslim and Christian Palestinian leaders. And we used to mostly have to meet outside of Israel because the majority of them could not come into Israel. And uh, you notice when you start talking to these uh, learned uh, religious leaders that uh, our values are actually exactly the same values. Uh, I remember even growing up in a Christian country where I had a classmate who taught uh, 
uh, Christian religion to children, and sometimes I felt that I had more in common with her than with some of the Jewish girls who had absolutely no religious upbringing because the principles and the beliefs are actually the same, and everyone has their way of expressing it and their way of living it, uh, but we have to accept that, that uh, ours is not the only way, that ours is maybe the right way for us as Jews, and uh, of course we, we believe in that, uh, but we have to respect that other people have their ways to serve God, and they're, and they're just as moral and just as uh, uh, God's, God's uh, children as any of us uh, are. We can uh, see throughout the generations, not only in our times, but already in medieval times, rabbis started writing Jewish law from this kind of perspective. Uh, they, they started, uh, they had to deal uh, on a regular basis with their Muslim and Christian uh, neighbors, and they couldn't just say, oh well, they're all idolatrous, we can't work with them, we can't uh, uh, do business with them, uh, we can't uh, help them if they're sick or, or uh, all kinds of uh, other interactions. And so that, that's why in uh, the Middle Ages they already explained that all of the, that these, specifically these two religions are far away from what the Talmud understands as idolatry. Um, and the Rabbeinu Tam, for example, the, uh, Rashi's grandchild writes that even though the Christians have the Trinity and they have three aspects of the of God. It's not actually like they have three different gods. They have different uh, facets of who God is. And uh, though we are not uh, allowed to, to pray to three kinds or three different expressions of our God, uh, for them it's okay and that's not idolatry. Um, the uh, Menachem HaMeiri, also a medieval uh, rabbi, wrote about how all of these people who are being, uh, their, their faith it goes in the right direction, are all uh, pure monotheistic, monotheistic religions. It's not our religion, but they're certainly not uh, idolatrous. And uh, if we take this perspective, which was much easier to apply to Muslims, in general, nobody had problems with Islam. It was always seen as a much more pure monotheistic religion than Christianity. Uh, but the vast majority of uh, decisors in Jewish law consider that both Christian, Christianity and Islam are not, uh, um, are not idolatry and uh, we should respect people for other religions for their humanity and because their beliefs and their morality are uh, on the same level and maybe sometimes even more than some of our very fellow Jews. Okay. Okay. Well, that was fascinating, as far as I was concerned. I'm sure you're all very interested um, in pursuing this. And I want to suggest that um, anyone who wants to ask a specific question to any one of the three speakers, um, address them. Or if you want to express an opinion uh, in general on the subject, whether it's to query, uh, how we relate to, if you want to tell an anecdote which illustrates something, uh, then you're welcome. I just wanted to um, um, mention, as far as Ethiopians are concerned, that I'm, I'm privileged to be associated with a project called the um, Israel Center for Excellence uh, for Educational Innovation, Israel Center for Educational Innovation, which was founded by a very close friend of mine, an American, uh, who was very distressed uh, after having been involved with getting Ethiopian Jews to Israel, being very much involved in that process, to see how they were discriminated against once exactly what you mentioned, uh, being assumed that they're primitive, the children were pushed out, uh, parents took their children out of schools to which a sizable number of Ethiopian children uh, applied and, and, uh, and entered. Um, and she realized that 
they had to be taught differently. They have to be differentiated modes of teaching altogether. And she started this project together with Columbia Teachers College, by the way, uh, of beginning from Kita Aleph with literacy to read and to write. Right? Never mind learning geography, history, whatever. First of all, literacy, not even arithmetic yet, not even numeracy, but, but literacy. Uh, the results of, and involved the parents. Uh, she arranged, uh, she's a great philanthropist, every classroom has 1,000 books graded according to difficulty of reading. And the teachers have been specially trained to help the pupils, a lot of individualized teaching, and the teacher then tells the pupil when he or she can move up in the level of, of reading. Those children at the end of Kita Aleph are writing stories. And I was present at an end of year ceremony when the children were ushered in and they each presented the little book that they had created. Right? Uh, and one of the boys came up to me and uh, showed me his book, which has, as he pointed out, a beginning, a middle, <laughs> and an end, right? And with little stick figure cartoons illustrating what happened. And when I asked him what he'd like to be when he grows up, he said, so fair, an author, right? And every year there's a competition of writing and in each level of class, from Gimel through Vav, prizes are presented to the children who've written the best stories. And the fact that the parents are involved, that the mothers were involved in embroidering bookcases which hang on the back of each chair. And each child takes a book home and reads to or with the children. Showed that, and now by the way, the white, the white parents, the, <laughs> the non-Ethiopian parents are streaming back to these schools because they're seeing the result right and I think that the the way in which pre uh, prejudices be, can be overcome by helping the people who are prejudiced against right to enter into the community uh, is amazing and I uh, the, the trouble here I think again is one of color uh, you know it's uh, the different white black, Brown, uh, that we tend we tend to flock towards people who are like ourselves. Right? I think that it's a difficulty of accepting someone who is different. Uh, so, if there are questions, comments, yeah, you want to talk on the yeah, take it. Um. Hi, I'm Carol Golden. I would like to talk about what I do at the Open University. I've been an instructor in English for the past 17 years at the Open University of Israel. And now I teach online, on the computer. And one thing that we have done is make special accommodations for Ethiopian students who are enrolled in the Open University. And they get a lot of extra tutoring and a lot of extra understanding and patience. And so they are doing a lot better. And many more of them are graduating university from the Open University of Israel because of the special accommodations that they have gotten. I just wanted to tell about that. Um, I've two questions, one for um, Rabbi Nick Jenny and one for uh, 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 Rabbi um, Mira. For Jenny, um, I just wanted to understand what you meant when you were saying that you thought for a religious 
single who's in her 30s, why it's more difficult than for a teenage or what the difference between that and a teenager as far as the um, not touching um, is concerned. Um, and for Mira, I wanted to know how, where we can get the resources to learn about the Ethiopian traditions and hear their stories. Would love to, where do we go to get that? Okay, so just to clarify, um, Halachically, in terms of Jewish law, there is no there is no difference. Um, but I think that existentially, there is a difference. In other words, with teenagers and teenage sexuality, is is all hormones. And I think mo most parents would say it's something that we'd rather, you know, we'd rather put the brakes on. Um, whereas I think that when we're talking about someone in their 20s, 30s, reaching a stage of life where sexuality is, is, is a part of, of our humanity. Um, and, and I think that there, um, it's, it's different. In other words, the person isn't, isn't just looking from a place of you know, the raging hormones and puberty, but it's also um, an, an existential search for, for, for community, for partnership. And, um, it's not something that halakha sees a difference between, but I do think that it's something that in the modern world that we're living in today, people view differently. There are various resources um, and various ways to, to learn about uh, the culture of the Ethiopian Jews. Specifically, I can say by the reform movement that towards those days, towards Yom Yerushalayim, um, and towards the SIGD, somewhere around November, um, the Reform Movement uh, website uh, gives very, very good resources. For example, Yizko, like the um, uh, a prayer in, uh, um, in memory of, uh, of those Jews, Jews who perished, uh, some descriptions of the, um, uh, of the, um, uh, of the journey, uh, some poetry, some prose, both written by uh, uh, people from Ethiopian origin and by, by other people. Um, and there are also various programs which put together, um, uh, you were looking for the word, so the word for, uh, for in Amharic would be frangi, like the, the whites, the, the rest of them, right? Uh, because the other is, we are the other in that, in, in that uh, case. So putting, have, uh, uh, getting together uh, Ethiopian Jews and Fanjim, right? Uh, in in all kinds of places, one wonderful program is run by um, um, uh, a group, uh, um, a, an NGO called Chavarim Bateva. It has Garinim, it has groups all over the country. One of them, one of the first one is in, in Gedera, in my, uh, where, where I previously used to work, and they are working together. They're having. Um, S and s several also mixed uh, mixed families, which is rare, because Ethiopian Jews more than in other uh, other ethnic groups in Israel tend to mix less for all kinds of uh, of reasons, which some of, some of them uh, y you've just uh, mentioned. Um, just doing things together, getting to know each other. Uh, some wonderful projects have to do with uh, with uh, traditional agri agri agriculture. Um, People came from Ethiopia with wonderful knowledge about cultivating, cultivating the land. Uh, their knowledge became useless here in Israel. And uh, the, uh, the general attitude is, uh, okay, now you come and learn how to be good, good Western Israelis, and because obviously you have nothing to teach us, right? No, of course you do. Um, and one of them is Gina uh, Kehilatit, a communal garden, and with, uh, and that's the kind of thing that that is run in various places. Gedera is one of them. It's very su successful in Gedera, despite. So I should know, learn about Be'er Sheva. I'm a newcomer to Be'er Sheva, so I there's still lots and lots of things for me to learn, and I'd be more than happy to to know to know more about it. opportunity to uh, do what they are creative enough to do. 
And they also started, that, and this goes back many years when the community center was uh, started, um, because they had a problem with within family relationships. The children were not really respecting the father and the mother because of the culture and because of the fact that they were not yet a part of the, uh, the land. And that particular uh, Jewish commu that community center was very, very important because um, Ron Lauder uh, started that community center and um, there were professionals that were going down it, from the Ethiopian community that had been here already to work with their own uh, people to bring the standard of commu family uh, unity together to, in, uh, to encourage the father to do what he knew best to do and the mother to be creative and become so that the children would learn to respect them and then grow. So um, I'm hoping, I think that's the same, the community center is still alive and well and uh, I was very, very uh, happy to be able to be, um, to be there, to see all of this and to, to see what the women were doing. So. Okay, this is a short story but it's a very personal story and I was, I'm still in shock about it. Uh, you probably all read in the newspaper, I live in Armona Natsiv on Mordechai Alkaki Street, and it's still an unsolved murder. People, I knew them. I knew them. This couple were murdered in their house. You all read it in the newspaper. Well, you haven't heard anything since because it's like blocked out. But what happened? It's horrible. First, it's horrible that they were murdered. I mean, it's a woman, she's like 62 years old, and her kids went to school with all the kids in the neighborhood. And I'm still double locking my door because the murderer is still <laughs> walking around. But here's my story. Immediately, one neighbor said, you know, there's an Arab young man working on this street. You know they arrested him. Now, I know this young man because he is a decent, wonderful, hardworking, kind person that we have been in, many, many of us have he he's, does the landscaping, he does the cleaning, whatever you need, and if you offer him more money than he told you it would be, he refuses to take it. They arrested him with no evidence and kept him for three weeks. For three weeks he couldn't work. He was in the, the only thing, and he says to me all the time, don't worry, it's all over, it's fine. They treated me very well. But I, I thought to myself, I come to this country and this, and this happens, I couldn't believe it. So I thought of what, you, what you're saying locally. I said, I have to do something. I couldn't get him out of the jail, but what I did do, and I'm not saying it to, to say I'm a great person, I'm saying it because it's something we can all do. I went, I got a card, I went to every door, like 30 people, and I asked them for money, for all the money he's going to lose. I asked them for a minimum of 100 shekels. I raised 1,700 shekels, and I made them, I said, it isn't only the money. I said, we're going to write a card which says, we appreciate you, and we are very sorry that this happened to you. We are absolutely upset, and we hope it will be over forever. And I got 21 people to sign the card. Many people, when I first said something, they said, yo, I don't really know him so well. And, you know, I said, you know him. And you know that he's a good person. But he's an Arab. You know, maybe he did do it. He's a person. He's a person. So that's, that's my story. Okay, I am Susan Marcus, currently of Tel Aviv, previously of Teaneck, New Jersey. And I wonder if anyone realizes it or it's just me. I thought our speakers were all very good, but you were all talking about very different things. The reform and conservative were talking about political issues. And I'm not disagreeing with them, but they were political issues. 
And our Rabba, whose name I forget, was talking, Rabba Neith, excuse me, I know, was talking about personal issues. And one of the problems I have had since I made Aliyah six months ago, because my son lives here, is you were talking about the whole community thing, okay? Being invited for Shabbat meals, you know, and, and I'm also divorced, so that's like a double strike against me. Um, in the conservative and reform movements that I've seen here, you don't have that kind of community. When I lived in Teaneck, it was mostly Orthodox, but there was a thriving conservative community, which I was part of, and we all did Shabbat lunch and Shabbat dinner, and everybody was in everyone's faces, and, and I still talk to them 10 times a day on WhatsApp. I came here. And I live down the block from a conservative synagogue, and I saw you there once, and there's nothing, 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 nothing. There's no there there. And I live in Florentine in Tel Aviv. And I have Shabbat dinner every week with my son and his family, except for we're out of town, when I have friends visiting from either California or New Jersey or New York, I have Shabbat dinner. But if I had to depend on that synagogue, I would be eating alone, always. I can't because my son lives in Yafo, and it's a really big, big struggle for me who wants to be a practicing conservative Jew I, you know, like I did all the sit-ins and I, you know, and I was in college in rev the revolution and I teach now in Florentine in a school that's very mixed. Kids are from Ethiopia, their parents are from the Philippines. I taught in the Bronx, so I'm, you know, I, I'm cool with all that. But for the conservative movement to have any resonance beyond right this minute, there's gotta be something more there. I rejoined my synagogue in Teaneck because I know, God forbid, I'm sitting Shiva, I'll have to go back to New Jersey, because they want, absolutely, they don't have Shiva. No, no, I, I, uh, excuse me, you're doing a, here a generalization. Yeah. Um, I, I, I very, you're, you have, I, you're right to a very large extent, but not totally. The, uh, if I'm not mistaken, if you say you saw me at your synagogue, that is not a typical conservative synagogue. It's nowhere within a region where conservative Jews live. And I can say from my experience with at least two conservative congregations that there's a lot of welcome, there's a lot of openness, there are kiddushim, the people do help with someone if anybody has a baby or lovely uh, sitting shiva there's immediately a, a recruitment of people helping uh, i do think that the conservative and reform movement need to be officially recognized and i'm sorry we didn't relate to that today because that's, that is really, to my mind, to exclude certain Jews who are practicing Judaism, right, is Chilul Hashem, right? And that's one thing we have to fight, and that's a political issue. Uh, we have to finish soon, so unless somebody has a really some burning question. <laughs> Here, would you, can you come, can you come up here, please? I think in all th three issues, a, a way of attacking it is to start some kind of movement in education in, the, in our public school systems to make the children aware, not of what their parents think and what their prejudices are, but to have some, gen in all three aspects that we were talking about today. I think it would make a very more pluralistic society here. Somebody else? I just wanted to say I'm from Zichon Yaakov, Kilat Barahta. And you spoke to hosting. 
very recently we realized that we have a lot of single people and also a lot of couples that just don't have a place to go Friday night to dinner. And we have a list of hosting and hosted. And people sign up to that list. Even me and my husband, who host all the time and sometimes really want someone else to host, <laughs> we join. So it's, it's, and it's working beautifully because those people who have not had a place, and Elisha Wolfen, who's our rabbi, immediately does a shidduch and people are hosted. So I don't know what shul you go to, but. Well, uh, I, I, think this has been, I think this has been a fascinating uh, discussion because it really uh, relates to our everyday lives and I hope we've taken away from it a, um, a sense of what we have, the, A, that we need to know more and B, that we know to do more. So, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.